zahnmähne tragen noch beide. Außer sie noch noch für gute Kitzfuhren. Und er kann Pähne am Behafer. Du, das ist ja das Oder-Kehrers. Okay? Um, come on, introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Tony Vale. I've been involved in older people care for over 25 years, working for Age Concern, Bracket UK also. Very recently focusing on issues around older people in care homes and care homes' relationship with the community. So I now work independently. I'm currently advising the National Care Home Group around activity provision. So I shall be you know, um, having that as well. Hi, I'm Joy Stanley. Um, I've been a youth leader all my life from about 15 onwards. So that was an early start, wasn't it? Probably youngsters as well. Um, and when I became a grown up, I got sort of lots of work thrown on me because I wasn't expecting I came from family members. I didn't have to do it when I was young, so I really appreciate and, and value the young, youngsters who do it because I don't think any young person should be having to do it. Um, I had to start in my 30s and that was old enough. You know, uh, so I really appreciate how difficult it was for me and I'm a professional carer to do it and how you youngsters do it, I don't know. Yeah. And I'm associated with Kelsey as well as I think. What we thought we'd do is we'd get in two incidents. One where uh, Joy is going to give you the, the story of a discharge that didn't really go that well. Then I'll come in with the other side of the story if that's all right. And then maybe we can look at why things go wrong. And then maybe we can look at what would make it better. What do you think? All right? Come on, Joy. Um, I moved to Norfolk um, about 10 years ago. I tell them from my accent. Um, I worked in the Northwest and I worked until I was 60. I would have worked till 65, but my husband was too sick. And I, had, I couldn't juggle it anymore. I had to, you know, retire. Um, when I came to Norfolk, Caring doesn't cease if that's in your head to do so. I was looking after my husband, but there were older people in the village who needed help. And I got involved with one called Molly. She was in her 90s, and she'd been into hospital because she fractured her pelvis. It's this region here, and you can imagine it really affects your mobility and your ability to do things on yourself an awful lot. Uh, she went into hospital and loved it. She was a very competent, beautifully turned out woman. Um, very chatty and very with it, absolutely all there. Um, she was in hospital for about a week and then they transferred her to Wyndham where they looked after that like, little queen, you know, in her own room. She had a wonderful time. And then they sent her home. And I said in church, who's looking after Molly? Deathly Hush. Who's look visiting Molly? Deathly Hush. We well, can't visit without her asking you to. Can't leave her there. So I popped in to see her with a meal on a plate um, and she was really delighted. I found the next day that she'd carved it in case she didn't get any food the next day. So she'd eaten the meal I'd given her, half of it, and was keeping the other half for the next day. I'm a specialist in palliative care and I had been a midwife on district, so I, I was sort of trained to pick up things. And I worked out she was getting no help at all, except for what she paid for herself. Twice a week, someone came in and did a cleaning and did a little bit of shopping for her. She had a nephew and a niece, but one was in Ireland and one was a little distance away. And her daughter and son-in-law had died. I managed to get her what was a tenant's allowance and a disability living allowance. She'd never asked it. I don't want anyone to do any. Um, trying to my financial affairs. They weren't Molly, which is what you need. I managed to get her, not the thing round her neck, she thought that was undignified, she'd have her around her wrist, thank you. Listening to people, hearing what they will accept. And I was popping in and out. Someone who has this part of their body, fractured, broken, whatever you like to call it, they can't do things for themselves. We really need to be eyes and ears and, and think about sending someone in the 90s home from hospital, nobody there, and I just happened to have moved to the area not too long before. I worked with a befriending service, setting up a befriending service in Northwood, and unfortunately those stories are many. 
you know, and we can have people discharged after 10 o'clock at night, particularly the ladies. So these stories are many. I've got to tell you my story. My husband's dead now, if it let you, he in his 90s. I don't think it was the same age as me, it was the same age as me. <laughs> right. So that's the first thing. Um, I had set up the befriending service. I chaired the health forum in North Norfolk. I knew an awful lot of folk and a lot of networks. My husband had been cared for by our GP for a long time with uh, rheumatoid arthritis and different uh, heart conditions. So when he was admitted to hospital urgently, um, we knew the people around us and we had loads of networks. I almost lost him, which was quite a shock to the system. And unfortunately, I had been caring him for quite some time and I got a wee bit depressed. And almost losing him was really hard, right? But when it came to discharging him, I didn't have any issues at all. He was um, discharged to a place which was absolutely lovely in Cromer, where he was cared for for a period of time until we set up the house and the folk came out and they measured all the different areas and they looked at the bed and realised it would be too low for me to lift up and the bathroom was all sorted out. You know, the, the OT came out and she sorted it. I knew that there was Red Cross that could come and visit them because I was still working, you see. So I got onto my pal at the Red Cross and that happened. And the Red Cross came in for six weeks and I knew the six weeks was coming up. So I went to the voluntary sector and I said, what about this befriending service then? You know, and can we get a befriender in for Ken? And we had a befriender set up. So we had all the medicines sorted out. And Ken was cared for until I felt well enough to really cope with all the different things in the house. But that does not always happen, unfortunately. You know, that was just a one-off. And there's other times when the discharge from places has gone completely wrong. And that was one instance where Ken's discharge was good. But it can be done if folk would talk to each other. But the, over to you now. This is your workshop. We want to hear from you about the things that go wrong with discharges. Let's hear about them. And did they be shy? Come on, I can't be doing the shy. I'm on the bad side. Come on. Lack of communication. Right, thank you. I think sometimes social work has been a barrier in the way. For example, they say to somebody who's becoming mobile, you can't, you can't come home unless you build, in a, build a walk-in shower. That's bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get the speakers as well in the camera. What's wrong with the kitchen? People in, in when I was a child, he washed in the kitchen. And Malcolm, um, Malcolm could no longer take the stairs. We didn't have a downstairs room. And we were you have to take a wheelchair. So it was be it was always you keep your bones separate. And there was room for the hoist, room for the wheelchair in the kitchen. And and it just to one side. And I think a lot of people are are imposing, it's health and safety again. Yes, it's gone there. Imposing <laughs> unnecessary barriers. And so the person is delayed in hospital while, while arrangements are made. When in fact, if you just use a bit of this, and if people are wanting to come home, and that they've got good backup by um, district nurse or social worker or whoever is needed, then it can be quite swift. And if they listen to the carer, and ask the carer, do you want to care? What do you need? So really one of the things um, that we're, we're saying that is really important is that the carer really has to have an input yes, to, to, to let them know what is needed. Well, they have voice, so they should be able to speak what they need, what they need. So things go wrong when the carer isn't involved, do you yeah, think? The carer needs to be asked. Yes, yes they're not, they're, 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 a lot of people are shy 
I mean, yeah. all of this. And there, there needs to be a system in hospitals that has it as top of thing. Get in touch with the well, the person who knows the best. It might be is, is the is it, the expert. They're very interested in getting in touch with the next of kin. Yes, but that isn't necessarily the yes. person who yes. knows the best. And the next, the person who knows the best doesn't have the same power under the law. Uh -huh. I'm interested in that, and I'm interested in what happens to our, our young folk. You know, do you do they ask you about uh, people when they're being cared for or anything? Do you get involved in it? No, it's nobody else gets asked about anything. And does he care? Yeah, he's my mum's full-time care, but we help. Uh uh -huh. I have to have a couple of little sisters as well. But when my mum goes into hospital, they, always, they don't understand what tablets my mum's taking. They always stop giving her the tablets that she actually needs. So my dad takes enough for that. So otherwise she won't get them. <coughs> right, so really without you or your, your dad, yeah. <laughs> she could actually even have the wrong medication. Actually that's where that this is me thing would come in because mm -hmm. there's, there's a, a big thing about control. medication. So the, yeah. it is me, so it's really quite useful. Yes. Now what about this side? Come on. What about the professional one? Yes, come on, give it. Give it. Can I first make a little point? When the legal man was talking, he was talking about imperatives, about whether you should continue to care. Um, the one that didn't get mentioned, which was very important to me, was that I had married in church and I had promised to sit me something help. Well, unfortunately, the sickness had arrived. <laughs> it was my husband with vascular dementia, and after seeing the consultant immediately, who very quickly, my GP was superb, after seeing the consultant who diagnosed this, we never saw a consultant again. Never. So you had a diagnosis then? We, we had always a new diagnosis that it's vascular dementia, we can give you no help, there is nothing can be done for vascular dementia. So uh, we never saw a consultant again. But when it came to the hospital discharge, um, he had a very minor fall which left him in, sitting in a pool of broken glass where he smashed the television set and the glass table off. Um, and he sat himself, well, we finally got him off the ground. Nobody's allowed to lift anybody in the I don't know if you know that one. Unless you're a carer. No, Amen. no, no, I'm not a carer. Unless you're a carer. Well, you know, unless you're a carer in the hall. Oh, 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 I can. He was six foot four, I'm five foot four. It's stone, I'm nine and a half. Oh, yes. <laughs> but when so that, I, sorry, can I just stop there? So that's a real issue, isn't it? Because we've got the, you know, the, the, the carer has their own issues about whether they can actually manage. And what about my interest is in mutual carers and older carers, older folk looking after each other, you know, and maybe both of you a bit crumbly? Well, you I was know? 79 when I left again. You were said from that Yeah. Because you always advise people to contact the paramedics straight away rather than lift yourself. Uh huh. But they won't lift anybody. Paramedics will. No, they won't. No. Well, they do now. They too. wouldn't even put them in an ambulance. Oh, they do have people. They had to get a hoist. We had to get a, a hoist from a friend when my husband had to go into the hospital because he was lying back in a chair where he'd been for three days. And the ambulance people came and um, they sort of had a look and sorted him all out, and then it, they got the phone <coughs> and then said, well, we're awfully sorry, but we can't get him from the chair after this. No, I can So uh, they, they know they said they were not allowed to. How long ago? 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 Um, oh, I can't work on that. This was a little one. It was at the time about four years. Because now they, they have it. So they're getting the flames. Yes. But, but, but at that time, they were not prepared to lift a kid. Oh, so what we do no, now, they, so, have, but have a, they have to call another ambulance. What can two ambulances and four people do? I don't know. So I suddenly called my friend who had a mobile hoist. And I ran her up and said, can we borrow your hoist? Yes. So if she brought it round, they said yes. They put the, we went out with it. They put him onto this uh, this sort of hoist, onto the trolley. By the time we got back in again, he was lying back like this, still almost comatose. And everybody had stopped moving and they were just about to prepare to take him out. After three days having said nothing moved, nothing whatsoever, he lifted up his head and he said, Thank God for that. <laughs> one of the, I think one of the important things that, that we're hearing is that we need, carers need information 
about what is available, and perhaps one of the issues is a lack of information. I'd like to comment on that. I think particularly I've noticed for self-funding people, when they need discharge from hospital, they're often given very limited information. They might be given a list of providers' names, which means absolutely nothing to them. Yes. I mean, I've had people contact us who will say, I have around, around 13 organisations and you are the first one mm -hmm. who can help us. Now, that, people shouldn't have to do that in, in a time of distress. distress. And my other, you know, Barbara talked earlier about how people hide behind confidentiality rather than helping right. people, perhaps. I think I, I also see sometimes people hiding behind um, they've got to be able to remain independent and impartial rather than help somebody. I might know a couple of organisations who could help, but I'm not going to tell you because I don't want to be seen as not independent, therefore I'll give you a list of six that you can be around. So I, I think there's, there's real concerns about giving people appropriate information that helps them when they need it. I can back that up because I had a serious eye injury and I couldn't see. I was feeling my way around the house. I'm there with my husband, 24-7 care, only had people coming in three times a day, self-funded, called social services team, because I knew the number without having to look it up, called them. They said, oh, we can't do anything because you're self-funded, we can't refer any help to, you know, for your husband. They referred me to the access team, social services access team, and the access team said, oh yes, we can help you. Um, we'll give you the um, information about the websites that you can go on to find a care home for your husband. I said, I can't see. Well, you'll have to have somebody come and do it for you then, won't you? And the information that they offered me was identical to what I had already had in print because I was helping other people look for care homes. So I had the information at hand, but I needed help to get them in immediately. And I think what we found out is that people who are not on um, um, allowances uh, very often struggle to get information, so that's it. Now, is there any other burning issues? One of the things I'd like to say is I'd love to see them um, start the discharge process right at the very beginning, and perhaps even if a person's going in for a knee replacement, uh, perhaps look at their homes and everything and make sure everything is in place and you know that people know what's happening. Another thing, right at the very beginning. Can we hear from our professionals? I don't feel that they're getting a first say here, just a bit of slating. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not what we're here. I think for myself, I'm quite new in the commissioning side of the service. I've always worked in day, day services, so I'm, I'm still learning a lot about Sort of discharge, but on a personal basis, my nan also fractured her pelvis and was in hospital. And we were very lucky because we had Nor Norfolk First support was put in for a few weeks until she decided that she was able to manage on her own. Well, that really helped us before we can actually put like a package of care in for my nan. So that instance was brilliant. But when she had a stroke, that was a totally different yeah. kind of fish. It was. Um, a very slow process, but when it came to Christmas, they wanted my nan out very quickly. <laughs> and we said, no, we haven't put in place what needs to be. So they're, they are very different, depending on what condition you yes. want in hospital for, it's very different to the actual discharge. And it, it's, it's, it's interesting own. because um, if you are very assertive and knowledgeable with individual, you can say no. But an awful lot of carers think they can't. And it's you know, and it's, it's how can you do that? There's another real problem for people with dementia because 60% of people with symptoms of dementia remain undiagnosed. And therefore, if they're undiagnosed, it's not on their notes. And a friend of mine in the village, I went to visit her, she'd had a fall, and she'd also got moderate dementia, but the family didn't want it diagnosed because they didn't want the stigma on it. And, and I went to visit her, and she was asleep, and I got talking to the staff nurse, and, and I said, you do know that Lillian's got dementia? And uh, she said, well, it's not on her notes. I said, no, it's undiagnosed. Well, if she's undiagnosed, then she hasn't got it. 
listening answer. So I said, well, I said, well, it doesn't matter. She said, oh, it doesn't. She's going home tomorrow. So I pricked my ears up and I said, oh, who's going to care for her? And as I told you in my, in my talk, how people mm -hmm. did in the past, she told them that her sister lived at home and her sister was going to care for her. Mm -hmm. And um, there was nobody asking about her daughter because she was on holiday in the Caribbean. Her sister died 15 years before this and her daughter was, it was had been back from, she went to the Caribbean about eight months before this. And she was, she was actually on the point of being sent home to a cold house with no food and with no carer. And she would have been dumped on the, on the doorstep. All because the, the staff in the hospital hadn't collected any information from the family about her situation at home. And, and therefore the involvement to the carer would have actually <laughs> made things better for the hospital because yes. she was fair. If an older person goes home and there's nothing in the cupboard, you know, and it's late at night, they're likely to fall, they need to go in, straight back to the hospital. So there isn't a role for um, a dedicated person to do a home check, yes. because even the dog trust send somebody, that's <laughs> what they do, they send somebody I to was in, I was inspected. Oh, it's a dog. So why, my, why can we release dogs we safely? We used to have almoners. We, we did have almoners. And I think that is, it, that is essential. Is that, yeah. without, I, I don't want to rattle on, but certainly in cancer services, when I was in charge of um, management of the cancer, I was looking at the discharge process and realised that what we had to do in London was we had to plan at the very beginning, particularly with our older people, and set it up right at the beginning and we have to have our doctors there to sign the discharge. And you have to have the discharge team and all working together. Could you but, tell um, me if can, any, I'm sorry, just wondering sorry, for a minute. If any of you work in hospital, can you put your hands up or have worked in hospital? Could you Mental please tell me what admission details you take now? Please, I hope that you do get the next of kin. Yeah. And sure. how they want to be looked after and likes and dislikes. And, Please. I work in younger adult kids, so it's yes. a little bit different, so it's 18 to 65. But we're specifically now finding out who the carers is, who the nearest relative yes. is, and what have you. Um, which makes a big difference, yeah. because then you've got someone to work yeah. with as part of a triangle of care, which is mm -hmm. most important. What I was going to say, though, with, with, with the problem with the, the, this, doctors will ever turn around and will ask, with the patient sitting there, with the carer sitting there, and go to the carer and say, are you happy to go home? Well, of course, they they, they've got to say yes, yes <laughs> haven't they? Because otherwise the patient's going to feel dreadful, and I think that puts, means that a lot of clients are ended up going home too early. And I think you're right. I think you're right. Break down. And, and, and I think it's very, very difficult for carers to see that. I think we've done a great job. We've no kind of what all the difficulties are. How can you make it better? What, what, what is needed? If we've been writing something, come on, you can help with this now. Well, I've been doing the picking up the threads of what that. So it's having a good backup, um, asking um, what do you need. Um, contact the person who knows best. Complete this is me. Having good information, uh, and that's appropriate information. Having an initial. Sorry, who's that? Uh, initial support service. Um, collect information from the family. Um, a dedicated person to do a home check. And then, um, and then I just want to hear a separate conversation with the carer. Because uh, that... Yeah, I think that's useful. Do you all agree with that? Have any of you youngsters been in on a conversation when they've said, is it all right if mum comes home? Mm. You have once.
Is there a role here, uh, Mary, for um, advocacy? Because um, yes, I, I, I mean that that you know being able to stand instead of somebody, um, as it were, you know, from all kinds of aspects. Is that? Yeah. Can I look at these these um, young women here, and I just say they are advocates. You're advocates for younger people, and you're doing a fantastic job. But you need. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Finished it. But you need someone to give you support. And we've got Cindy here. Is it Cindy? Yeah. 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 Within that role, but we see it's down to whether we're contacted to come in and then sort of advocate for these guys. Mm -hmm. Because obviously, if their student sort of parents are being released from hospital, they're potentially going to need time off school. Yeah. And then we're, we're going to have to go in and sort of see these with education. So they would actually be not be at school for the next sort of few days because. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we, we tend to be told kind of after the event, don't we? Also from so the, the timing is really sorry, oh. sorry. The, <coughs> the timing is really important, isn't it? That if we actually were planning this early enough, you could be involved. We could have advocates. Um, I don't know how our health service would feel about that, but it seems sensible to have people. We, we have past carers. We've got maybe an untapped resource. You were, you were saying it's obviously, I mean, I'm a past carer as well. I think I've paid all my life, but um, it is important. It drives you, doesn't it, to make things better. You know, you want things to be better for other people. If you know, we well, haven't heard either. anything from that young lady. Let's just get the bag sorted. I wasn't. I was on chickens. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was, uh, I just thinking uh, something that I read me from Barbara's uh, um, talk was that map of all of those different yeah. uh, yeah. and how complicated everything yeah. is with all those specialists and, and that seems kind of the madness that my um, neighbour had a, um, a problem with her uh, elderly husband being discharged because she had to, he was ready to go but they didn't have the equipment and they hadn't got the care resorted, they hadn't got this, they hadn't got that so he had to spend another three or four days in hospital just waiting to, to come back because of all of that complex map so and that is, that is a that is such a waste of resources because uh, having managed beds, beds are your most expensive thing in healthcare, and it's, it's a complete waste of resource. And when you see the papers, all you read is about is they can't get people in. Well, actually, we can't get the folk out. <laughs> Can I just you know? mention what happened? Uh, you know what happened with my husband after his fall and he's gone into hospital. Very soon, we had a meeting with two social workers, a doctor, and I don't know what the other lady was, and they, he talks through how, what help we would need. Mm -hmm. Three helpers, two times, a, uh, two helpers, three times a day. And a good few days later, I'm sorry, it have to be one helper, three times a day. You would have to be the other one, and we'll show you how to use voices and things like that. After a time later, it was, we think it'd only be one helper twice a day. And then after he'd been in hospital four weeks, and that was all it was, because there was nothing wrong with him, nothing at all, and by this time. After the four weeks, I went in every day. On the Wednesday evening, I got a telephone call to say, um, we're awfully sorry, we can't supply you with any help whatsoever, and your husband's being discharged on Friday. This was Wednesday evening. So I had got to set up what they thought I needed three times a day to help. It, uh, we were, my daughter and I, she lives where I but I was on the phone. We were so distressed, we didn't know what to do. I said, I must go and see the doctor tomorrow. Went in and asked to see the doctor. And the doctor said to me, I'm off his side. I didn't know your husband was being discharged on tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know he wasn't getting any help at all. So she said, you, she only said these two sentences. You must arrange all the help that you need and take all the time that you need. When you are happy about that, we I'll arrange for him to be sent home. It took me a week. In that time I spoke to 14 different people and three different organisations. And finally I found a small organisation who arranged for one person with no training and no experience with people with dementia twice a day for one hour. So we, Otherwise, I'm her complete yeah. carer, and then he was discharged. And I think this happens more often than... This, this, than is, than this sort of thing is still happening. Yes. This and, is in and, the past, and, and it's still happening. What we can do to improve that 
is we need to provide, it, it can't be awfully off hard to provide maybe a self-help guide. A discharge you know, plan and a care path. Well, just, just do it quickly. Um, this is the question you need answered, you know, about discharge. And, and when your person goes into hospital, are you starting to arrange this because I've got this, that and the next thing? And particularly if they're having a, a knee operation or something, you know they're going to be a wee bit uh, less able. You know, maybe we need to take a wee bit of control it as well and sort of be, be a bit more campaigning, dare I say, you know, for it. Well, what about these two ladies? Are you <laughs> Yeah, I just the care home side, don't you? Yeah. That's very important. She loves to pick them. <laughs> no, I want to hear you, Professor. What equality. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we still face challenges when they people in their own homes do. But we are lucky that we might have the equipment here. Um, we mm. have got a close contact with our district nurses. So if we know someone's coming out, we can get onto them straight away if anything has changed and they need anything. But sometimes that doesn't happen, not even for us in the care homes. You know, we can hit yeah. barriers just by people in their own homes. And I've home. actually done both sides. I've done care in the community as well as in the home. So, so when you go and assess a patient before the discharge? Yeah, sometimes, not all the time, sometimes Information we, we might just random. get a phone call to say so-and-so's coming home, um, will you take them? And okay. um, um, they might not get back to us till midnight. Okay. They will ship them out really late at night. But that's the residential home. It is, yeah. I mean, and we send in communication to the hospital with them if they've got any and what they like what, what they like but we get phone calls who's next to kids what's this person like that information that we send them even from the homes lost somewhere on route i was at a, a conference uh, not far away uh, last week yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> there we were <laughs> yeah. well, there we are that's the only part. and there was a speaker from the n and n in fact all the other hospitals as well um, uh, presenting their case from the hospital side of yeah. the and it was recognised there was a big issue yeah, in terms of communication. Um, a hundred, what was it, 120 different bits of paper while you were yeah. in the hospital had to be filled in, yeah. um, and so on. So these, this is the system that's being paid for, you know, um, and the effect it's having on the front. But also with the next of kin as well, when we've got people that haven't got any next of kin, the information is then limited to what we get. Yeah, if, you know, where the so with the managers, we are even limited on the information so that's that, right. that, that, that we are told. Yeah. And, and, and as you said, this whole notion of next of kin is a 20th century concept. That's something yeah, that's it's 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 the last yeah. 20th century. Yeah. century because um, my brother-in-law has, uh, has had a partner for 20 years or more. He was seriously in hospital and they would and needed to get him home. And they had to ask his son and daughter because they would not accept his partner as a person to make any decisions. They might be next to kin but they might not actually be caring for that. No, but they're not well. considered to be an extra yeah. kin if yeah. they're a partner. And it's if you get partner, well, forget it, yes, nobody wants to know. What about the issue? It's not issue. everybody before we... Yeah. Training. I, I need to... Train. Training. Training. I need to... Uh, For the carer. You know, think of this down. So, come on. What do we need? Training? What did you say, Christine? Oh, yeah. oh, training is yours. Training. Okay. What about our mental health expert? Oh, what would improve it? Quiet chat with parents first of all. Yeah, right. yeah, we, yeah, I think we got that one. Yeah. Communication. Yeah. Yeah. Is it the communication? Yeah. Assessment yeah. 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 and care plans on leaving hospital. Did you hear that? Okay. Next I, one. Thank you. I'm yeah. showing up. My right. training. Training. I'm on with the communication. Communication. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
is the communication and listening to the carer. Listening to the yeah, carer. Thank you. I think this is on the way on. Whose responsibility is it to tell the carer that they have a right to be involved in this charge? Who's going to tell them that? Is it the GP? Is it self-funding? They haven't got this. Nothing about us without us. But the children are the ones that are easily ignored, aren't they? Yeah. Not the I think this is absolutely brilliant, <laughs> and it's been absolutely fantastic today. And um, well, I'm still going on with my campaigning, <laughs> and um, I, my Sheila McKechnie Award and everything, and I'm campaigning on behalf of older carers that I will actually take care of carers on board. I promise. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.